The meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Business and Financial Operations Committee is called to order in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act. A quorum of the committee is present and the meeting is now declared open. It is 9.32 a.m. Uh, first order of business is approval of the minutes. Are there any amendments or objections to the proposed minutes as presented? Hearing none, the minutes as presented on the agenda will stand approved. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the Manufacturing, Agribusiness, and Logistics Division Report, which will be presented uh, by MAL Division Director, Mr. Billy Hirsch. Mr. Hirsch, if you are ready, please proceed. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Collier, members. Today, we have three items on the agenda. During the regular session of the Texas uh, Board of Criminal Justice meeting, we will recommend the board approve these items. First item is a request for electrical easement expansion at the Montfort unit in Lubbock County. The city of Lubbock acting by and through the Lubbock Power and Light is requesting an easement expansion at the Montfort unit. The city is requesting an easement of 0.842 acres of land being 1,272.79 feet long by a variable width to expand their current 10 foot permanent easement. The request includes temporary workspace totaling 0.262 acres of land. If you can direct your attention to the screen, you'll see where the uh, red line is the area that's in, uh, that we're talking about today. Lubbock Power and Light has agreed to pay $4,615 for the easement with a 10 year term I would like to point out that this easement includes language requiring indemnification as the grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause, and additional insured insurance in the amount of $3 million. I'm available for questions. Seeing no questions, we'll move to the second. This is a request for a meter site at the Luther unit in Grimes County. ETC Katy LTD is requesting a meter site overlapping a current permanent pipeline easement at the Luther unit. Katy Pipeline is requesting an easement of approximately 0.057 acres of land being 50 feet long by 50 feet wide. Direct your attention to the screen. You can see the area that we're talking about, more or less in the northwest corner of the, of the facility there. ETC Katy Pipeline Limited has agreed to pay $2,500 for the meter site with a 10 year term. Would like to point out that this easement also includes language requiring indemnification as a grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause, and additional insurance in the amount of $3 million. I stand ready for questions. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the third one. This is a request for an amendment to the electrical easement at the East Town Ferguson unit in Houston and Madison County. The Houston County Electric Co-op is requesting an amendment to the existing electrical easement, specifically at the Ferguson unit. The co-op is requesting an easement of approximately 5.15 acres of land, being 7,488.36 feet by 30 feet wide to accommodate an upgrade to the current electrical line servicing the Ferguson unit. The term will be renewed with the original 10-year easement, which expires December of 2024. To direct your attention to the screen, you can see the old existing line is in yellow and the new line is in red. The new line actually runs uh, by our, our all weather roads, makes it a little bit easier for us to get in and fix them in, in, in times of repair. No compensation be offered due to the easement being used to supply electricity to the unit. I still stand available for questions. So Mr. Hirsch on this one, we, um, we, we don't have a, um, really we're not granting uh, any additional uh, real estate. No, sir, we're just moving the, the current line to make it easier for them to do repairs so we can have a more uh, dependable electrical supply to the facility. It works out both for them. They had to upgrade their existing line and they took advantage of it. And then we asked that they do it down our existing all weather roads. We call that a win-win, right? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, sir. Uh, the last item on the agenda is the facilities division report. Uh, status of board, board approved projects presented by facilities division director, Mr. Cody Gensel. Mr. Gensel, please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Collier, members, I'd like to provide an update of the status of the board approved projects. Item number one is our Jester 4 unit roofing project. This project is currently, as of today, at 78% complete. Contractors completed the main building roof replacement is now working on the adjacent roof of H building. Item number two is the pilot unit roofing project. This project is currently at 98% complete as of today and is on the closeout phase. Construction is complete. Item number three is a co-field unit roofing project. This project is currently at 12% complete as of today. Contractor is on the final stage of the roof replacement for an, out, for an outbuilding roof and is conducting pull tests for the main roof to determine density and integrity of the lightweight concrete subdecking. Item number four is the Michael unit roofing project. This project is currently at 4% complete as of today. The contractor is working on demoing sections of the 12 building roof. Item number five is a young unit roofing project. This project is currently at 6% complete. Contractor has completed section eight, section A pending final membrane application and is now working on section B of the unit. Item number six is a huge unit design only uh, for roof replacement. This design is currently at 45% complete as of today. The next two items, number seven and eight, are replace uh, plumbing controls and fixture projects at the Ellis and Estelle units. The Ellis unit project is currently at 74% complete as of today. And the Estelle unit project is currently at 66% complete as of today. These are our intelligent conservation or ICON projects that are completed by our facilities division in-house maintenance department. Change the slide. Item number nine is the Berg unit project to replace a locking system on A and C cell blocks. This project is currently at 94% complete as today. They've made extensive progress uh, over this last month, and we're currently in the closeout phase. The contractors completed the final installation on C cell block. Item number 10 is the Lindsay unit project to replace the locking system. This project is currently at 40% complete as of today. Uh, the contractor is working to install locking mechanisms in buildings G1, G2, and G3. Item number 11 is a pack unit project to install air conditioning. This project is now complete. Installation of the air conditioning piece of the project was completed on April 1st, 2020. The remaining piece of the project was to upgrade the electrical system, which is now complete. Item number 12 is a Hodge project to install air conditioning. This project is currently at 25% complete as of today. Contractors placed all four air handling units as a near completion of the outside work required. Item number 13 is the Mountain View project to complete, uh, to replace the wastewater, or excuse me, to replace the water distribution lines. This project is now complete. And item number 14 is the Mountain View project to replace the groundwater storage tank. Uh, this project is now complete as well. Item number 15 is the wind unit project to replace the primary electrical distribution system. This project is currently at 50% complete as of today. The contractor is ahead of schedule. Contractors currently working on conduit installation and installing concrete pads for equipment. And lastly, item number 16 is the Ferguson unit design only for the replacement of the water treatment plant. This design is currently at 50% complete as of today. This concludes my project status update. I'll stand by for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Gensel. Um, any questions from the committee? I would just be curious, Mr. Gensel, about how much of uh, of the delay in some of these projects, in your view, was caused by the pandemic and the resulting shutdown? Uh, well, I think uh, what we've seen is our subcontractors uh, for some of our vendors out there have been more difficult to, uh, to obtain because of the COVID, uh, not wanting to come in or either some of their subcontractors or have COVID or been exposed to COVID. So it's definitely been a, an impact in that arena. But I can tell you that most of our contractors have done a good job of moving forward, as you can see from the uh, progress on the projects. So 
uh, we're continuing to work with them daily and, and uh, very pleased with what they're doing. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Gensel, appreciate that. Um, with uh, with any other questions, uh, just if, if there are none, uh, I think that concludes our meeting. Um, the meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice Business and Financial Operations Committee is now adjourned. It is 9.42. Thank you. And we'll stand Thank down you. till 10 o'clock for the board meeting. The 213th meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is called to order in accordance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, the Open Meetings Act. During this meeting, the board will be conducting business from the agenda posted in the Texas Register. Members of the board present for this meeting include Vice Chairman Darylynn Perriman, Secretary Pastor Larry Miles, members Mano de Ayala, Judge Faith Johnson, Judge Molly Francis, Eric Nichols, Ambassador Sishan Siv, and Dr. Rodney Burrow. A quorum of the board is present and the meeting is now declared open. It is 10 o'clock. Uh, we will now start with the pledges to the uh, Texas and United States flags. Uh, I would invite Deputy Director Oscar Mendoza to lead us in the pledges. Mr. Mendoza, please proceed. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members, Mr. Collier. Please join me in our nation's pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. of the United yeah. States of America, of America. and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, yeah. one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Texas pledge, honor the yeah. Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Pastor Miles, will you open our meeting up with a word of prayer? Yes, sir, join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this new day and for your mercy that is new upon us this very morning. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six tells us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Father, we trust you today and we ask for your help as we conduct the business of TDCJ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Miles. As a courtesy to speakers and guests in the meeting, please turn electronic devices to the silent or vibrant mode. Thank you. I know this is a virtual meeting and many are watching, but I would like to take a moment and say thank you to any public officials and or staff representatives with us today. Thank you for joining and thank you for your support. Let us begin. The Texas Board of Criminal Justice is committed to providing an opportunity for public presentations on posted agenda topics, as well as public comments on issues within its jurisdiction as provided in Board Rule 151.4. Persons interested in speaking at today's meeting were required to complete and submit the registration form provided in the posting of today's meeting by 5 p.m. on October 28, 2020. For today's meeting, no speaker registration forms were received by board staff prior to the required deadline. Therefore, no public presentations will be heard on posted agenda topics today, and no public comments will be heard on issues within its jurisdiction. We will now turn to um, our vice chairman, Darylynn Perriman, to make some remarks. Ms. Perriman. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and the Texas Council on Family Violence sponsors a Go Purple Day each October. Although our board meeting does not fall on that day, the Texas Board of Criminal Justice and TDCJ personnel are wearing purple today in recognition of this important issue. The Texas Department of Public Safety reports family violence statistics each year, and in 2018 reported more than 212,000 victims and 207,000 offenders involved in family violence in Texas. We also know 
that statistically only about one in 10 incidents are actually reported to law enforcement. So the number of Texans affected, affected by domestic violence or family violence is clearly much higher. In 2018, 175 women and 26 men were murdered by an intimate partner and more than 200 children lost parents. One in 15 children are exposed to intimate partner violence each year and 90% of these children are eyewitnesses to this violence. Victims of intimate partner violence lose a total of 8 million days of paid work each year, and the cost of intimate partner violence exceeds $8.3 billion per year. Between 21 and 60% of victims of intimate partner violence lose their jobs due to reasons stemming from the abuse. The mission statement of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is to promote public safety, promote positive change in offender behavior, reintegrate offenders into society, and assist victims of crime. Domestic Violence Awareness Month is a time to renew our commitment to do our part to end domestic violence in the great state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perriman, for those very moving and timely remarks. Thank you. Let's now uh, begin the recognitions. Mr. Collier, you have the first recognition, and I might add a special one. Retired yes, CID Director Lori Davis, and this is a well-deserved recognition. Mr. Collier, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel. Uh, it is truly a privilege to be able to do this recognition. Uh, today, I want to recognize Ms. Lori Davis on her retirement, uh, which occurred in August from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And Lori, as you indicated, was our Correctional Institutions Division Director. Lori began her career with our agency in 1988 as a correctional officer at the Ellis Unit. She promoted through each one of the correctional series ranks and in 2005 was promoted to warden. She served as the senior warden on seven, seven different facilities and was promoted a regional director in 2012. In 2013, Lori was promoted to training director for the Correctional Institutions Division. In 2014, she was promote, promoted to deputy director for management operations for the Correctional Institutions Division and then later served as the Deputy Director for Support Operations. In 2016, she was promoted to the Director of the Correctional Institutions Division. During her busy career, Lori also managed to fit in time to obtain her bachelor's degree from Midwestern State University and her master's degree in public administration from Texas Tech. As the Director of the Correctional Institutions Division, Lori was met right off the bat with challenges. We had a flood, Short time later, we had the tragic murder of Mary Ann Johnson. A year later, we had Hurricane Harvey. We had heat litigation. And finally, with COVID-19, the impact of the most significant operational event in the agency's history. In each one of those challenges, Lori led with strength, determination, creativity, and grit. I firmly believe that the good Lord puts the right people in the right places at the right time. And I absolutely believe Lori Davis fit that bill and we've been blessed to have her during these tough times. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Davis on her well-deserved retirement after serving our agency for over 31 years. Lori, we wish you the absolute best in your retirement, and we are all indebted to you for your sacrifice and service to this agency and the state of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Collier and Ms. Davis. I just want to say that I very much appreciated all of your advice and help when I first got on the board. Uh, you were one of the people that really helped me get up and running with the way TDCJ operates. And I just want to say thank you personally. Thank you so much for all that you've done. And I wish you the best in your retirement. And we will all miss you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Chairman. All right, Mr. Collier, I understand you have a few more recognitions to introduce to us today. Please yes, proceed. I'll proceed. Uh, next, I would like to recognize Mr. Bobby Lumpkin. We're doing a little switch there. On his recent promotion to the Director for the Correctional Institutions Division. Mr. Lumpkin began his career in 1990 as a correctional officer at the Bird Unit. Bobby promoted through the correctional ranks to assistant warden, and in 2003, he was promoted to the Administrative Review and Risk Management Division as the agency accreditation manager. In 2007, Mr. Lumpkin was promoted to deputy division director for the private facility contract monitoring and oversight division, and in 2013, was promoted to director of manufacturing, agribusiness, and the logistics division. 
In August of this year, he was promoted to his new role as director of the Correctional Institutions Division. Mr. Lumpkin has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in criminal justice leadership and management, both degrees from Sam Houston State University. Mr. Lumpkin's broad base of leadership experience in the agency combined with his strong operational focus will serve our agency well as he assumes this new role. Please join me in congratulating Bobby on his, new, on his promotion as the director of the Correctional Institutions Division. And apparently he's out directing because he's not on the queue. I'm here, sir. Okay, good deal. Well, congratulations, Bobby. Thank, thank you, Mr. Collier. Thank you, board, uh, Chairman O'Daniel, to the board members. Thank you all for the support. Excellent. Next, Chairman, I would like to recognize Billy Hirsch on his recent promotion to the Director for the Manufacturing, Agribusiness, and Logistics Division. Mr. Hirsch began his career with the agency in 1986 as a correctional officer at the Estelle Unit. He promoted through the correctional ranks to senior warden. In 2014, Billy was selected as the Deputy Division Director for the Private Facility Contract Monitoring and Oversight Division. And in 2016, he promoted to Deputy Director for Prison and Jail Operations for the Correctional Institutions Division. In September, Mr. Hurst was selected as the Division Director for the Manufacturing, Agribusiness and Logistics Division. Mr. Hirsch has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in criminal justice leadership and management, both from Sam Houston State University. Throughout his career, Mr. Hirsch has proven himself as a strong operational leader who gets the job done. His grit and focus on our agency mission have been evident in each role he's held, and he will serve our agency well as he assumes this new role. Please join me this morning in congratulating Mr. Hirsch on his promotion. Billy. Thank you, boss. Appreciate you, members. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would next like to recognize Tina Clark on her recent promotion to the Director of the Information Technology Division. Ms. Clark began her career with the agency in 1993 as an accounting clerk within the Human Resources Division. She promoted within the Human Resources Division to a Human Resource Specialist and left the agency to work in a local school district in 2000. In 2006, Tina returned to TDCJ and found her career home within the Information Technology Division. She promoted from a Systems Analyst to a Project Manager 2, later a Project Manager 3, and in 2018, Tina was promoted as the Deputy Division Director for the Information Technology Division. In September of this year, Ms. Clark was promoted to her new position as the Director for the Information Technology Division where she serves as our chief information officer. Tina brings a strong operational background and knowledge of our agency's information technology systems to her new role. Her commitment to the agency mission and her track record of creatively working with all areas of TDCJ to find solutions will serve our agency well. Please join me this morning as we congratulate Ms. Clark on her promotion as the Director of Information Technology Division. Tina, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Next chairman, I would like to recognize Cody Gensel today for attaining the mark of 30 years of service with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Mr. Gensel started with TDCJ in 1990 as a correctional officer at the Huntsville unit after having worked for the Wyndham School District as a clerk for two years. Mr. Gensel promoted through the correctional ranks to warden and later served as a regional director, training director, and in 2015, he was promoted to deputy director for management operations within the Correctional Institutions Division. In 2016, Cody was promoted to the Director for the Private Facility Contract Monitoring and Oversight Division, where he remained until March of this year when he promoted to the Director of the Facilities Division. Cody has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Lamar State University. Mr. Gensel, Mr. Gensel has significant experience leading in large operational areas and his transition earlier this year to the facilities division went off without a glitch. He hit the ground running and has done an outstanding job in his new role. Cody is a creative and dynamic leader and we're very fortunate to have someone of his caliber in this agency. Please join me this morning as we congratulate Cody on attaining 30 years of service with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Cody, congratulations. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, next I would like to recognize April Zamora on her attainment of 25 years of service to our state. April began her career with TDCJ in 2000 as a parole officer at the Austin II District Parole Office. Prior to beginning her work with TDCJ, April worked for the University of Texas Pan American, as well as the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. April promoted through the ranks in parole, serving as a unit supervisor, program administrator, and program specialist. In 2007, she was promoted as the manager of the Texas Correctional Office on Offenders with Medical or Mental Impairments, otherwise known as TACUMI, or the longest acronym in state government. In 2012, April was promoted to the Director for the Reentry and Integration Division, where she has led the agency's significant efforts on offender reentry. As director, she's worked to improve our processes related to obtaining birth certificates, social security cards, and state identification cards for offenders to improve their employment opportunities as they're released. She's also continued to maximize our mental health treatment options for our probationers and parolees through the mm -hmm. Texas Correctional Office on Offenders with Mental, Medical and Mental Impairments, which she still oversees. Mrs. Amora leads with passion and her passion has led to success for this agency. Please join me this morning as we congratulate April on attaining 25 years of service to the state of Texas. April, congratulations. Mr. Collier, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that, that concludes my recognitions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Collier, and congratulations to all. Ms. Dunbar, you have the next recognition, and with you today is your new Deputy Director, Ronald Givens. Sir, good morning, Chairman, and board members, and Mr. Collier. I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Ronald Givens, the new Deputy Division Director for the Private Facility Contract Monitoring Oversight Division. Um, as of tomorrow, Mr. Givens will have 27 years of experience with TDCJ all of which previously has been with the Correctional Institutions Division and most recently um, as the Region 3 Director. We are very excited to have Mr. Givens in PFCMOD and if you will please join me in congratulating him on his newest promotion. Congratulations sir. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Thank Dunbar. you Ms. Dunbar Thank and you, congratulations on your promotion Mr. Givens and your 27 years. Yes sir. Thank you to all. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lumpkin, I understand you have the next recognition, and with you today is your new regional director, Marisha Jackson. Mr. Lumpkin, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Call, your members. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Mrs. Marisha Jackson, the Region 3 Director for the Correctional Institutions Division. As you all know, we have six regions within CID, and each are unique. Each of them are unique. Region three consists of 19 units, and is an example with both male and female institutions and state jail offender populations, a psychiatric facility, two unique hospital operations, and an intermediate sanctioned facility. Uh, Marisha began her career in 1993 as a correctional officer at the Plutsky unit and has since held every uniform supervisory position, including assistant warden and senior warden on several units. During that time, she also received her Bachelor of Science and Master of Security Management from the University of Houston. Mrs. Jackson, in addition, received the Criminal Justice Administrator of the Year Award during the Governor's 2019 Criminal Justice Volunteer Service Awards. Uh, Marisha is a strong, strong leader she, she's a person of strong moral character and is, has the ability to visualize the mission of the agency and is going to be a huge asset to the agency as we face new challenges and opportunities going forward. Please join me in congratulating and welcome Mrs. Jackson. Congratulations, Marissa. Thank you, Mr. Lumpkin. Ms. Jackson, congratulations on your promotion. And uh, I think that is all for our recognitions uh, from our executive staff. 
Uh, the Texas Board of Criminal Justice recognizes TDCJ employees who have dedicated 25, 30, 35, and 40 years of service to the state of Texas. These individuals represent the strong commitment of this agency staff system-wide. I, along with my fellow board members and executive director, Brian Collier, express our deepest gratitude for their continued service. During the months of September and October 2020, 67 employees attained 25 years of service, 33 employees attained 30 years of service, 17 employees attained 35 years of service, and five employees attained 40 years of service. Today, I would like to individually recognize the employees that have attained 40 years for their dedication and service. First, Carolyn Jones. She's the Laundry Manager 3, has been with the state of Texas for over 40 years. She began her career at the Crockett State School in 1977 and worked there from 1977 to 1979. The school closed for an, uh, an unknown reason in 1979. However, it reopened shortly after in 1980. She returned to the Crockett State School in 1980 and worked there until 2007 when she retired. She was in retirement only a few months until returning to the Crockett State School from 2007 until 2012. In 2012, the Crockett State School permanently closed and she transferred to the Ellis unit where she worked as a correctional officer for approximately two years. In 2014, Mrs. Jones promoted to Laundry Manager 3 in the Ellis unit laundry department and presently remains in that position. Mrs. Carolyn Jones is a hardworking, dedicated employee, and the Ellis unit is proud to have her. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. Next, Officer Sylvester Reed. He began his career with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice in November of 1983. Upon graduating the academy, he was assigned to the Hospital Galveston Medical Facility until his retirement in April of 2005. Officer Reed returned to the agency in July of 2005, working at the Carol S. Young Medical Facility, where he continues to serve the state of Texas. The Young facility is proud of his accomplishment of 40 years of service for the agency. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Next, Melody Watson. She graduated from Sam Houston State University in 1979 with a Bachelor of Criminology and Corrections. After graduating, Ms. Watson began her career with the Texas Department of Corrections on June 4, 1979 as a correctional officer at the Gorey Unit. In May of 1981, she promoted to Lieutenant at the Gatesville Unit then to captain in 1983. On November 4th, 1985, Miss Watson left the correctional series and began a career in the field of diagnostics as an administrative assistant. In November 2001, Miss Watson retired but returned later in the year to the Gatesville unit as a sociologist where she remains today. Ms. Watson has been a valuable asset in her service to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the state of Texas. The Crane Unit is extremely proud of her accomplishment of 40 years of service for the great state of Texas. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Next, Officer Gary Blazingame began his career over 40 years ago with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice in September of 1978. He transferred from the Wayne Scott unit to Hospital Galveston on November 1, 2001. Officer Blazingame retired from the agency in December of 2006, but returned to work in 2007. 
Officer Blazingame is a dedicated employee that displays the agency's core values. Officer Blazingame has experience working in all areas at Hospital Galveston and has proven to be an asset and a mentor to the up and coming new generation of officers. To this day, he works for the state of Texas at the Hospital Galveston facility. Thank you, Mr. Blazing Game. Lastly, I would like to recognize Officer Philip Tyson. He began his career with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice 40 years ago in June of 1980. Upon graduating from the academy, he was assigned to the Huntsville Walls Unit from 1980 to 1985. Officer Tyson transferred to the Bird Diagnostic Unit in 1985 and worked there for three months until being assigned to offender transportation. Officer Tyson worked in offender transportation from 1985 until he retired on August 31st, 2005. He returned to the agency in transportation on January 9th, 2006, where he is currently assigned. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. And thank all of you for your perseverance, integrity, courage, and commitment to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. I would like to add that the names of these employees will be submitted for inclusion in the official minutes of this board meeting. The Texas Board of Criminal Justice congratulates each of these employees and thanks you for your unwavering loyalty and dedication to the citizens of the great state of Texas. As a symbol of our appreciation, each of you will receive a board certificate along with a personal letter of gratitude. Thank you very much, all of you, and well-deserved. The next agenda topic covers consent items. Are there any amendments, objections, or abstentions to the proposed consent items? Hearing none, the consent items posted for this meeting's agenda will stand approved. The next item on the agenda will be a report from the TDCJ Executive Director, Mr. Collier. If you're ready, would you like to proceed? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman and members. Good morning. Um, I first want to say thank you uh, to each of you, really, for your continued support of this agency during these very trying times. Your support of our staff and our leadership team has been unwavering, and it is very much appreciated. And I just first want to start off with saying thank you to each of you. I want to update you today on agency efforts related to COVID-19. During the past 60 days, we've seen our overall positive rate for offenders and staff drop to the lowest numbers we've seen since March. The numbers of staff and offender hospitalizations have also decreased. As we've seen these declines, we are doubling down on our preventative measures as well as modeling new testing strategies as we prepare ourselves for the potential of another wave of COVID-19. Our new testing strategy will provide for each unit in the system to be tested every three weeks. Testing will include a random number of staff and offenders at each location with follow-up mass testing to be conducted in the event positive rates are identified through the random testing. These tests will be conducted by our unit wardens and unit staff who are being trained now on how to administer the testing at their locations. Our compliance assessment teams are also conducting unannounced audits of unit locations and office locations to help ensure that we're following all of our protocols related to COVID-19. After each unannounced visit, I, the unit warden or office administrator and the division director receive a summary of the findings and observations. We are also closely monitoring community COVID-19 positive rates and increasing our focus on units in areas that reflect increased community numbers. At all of our agency locations, we continue to clean, disinfect, utilize masks for staff and offenders, social distance, limit travel, utilize all available resources we have to prevent the outbreak of COVID-19. We are continuing to fight hard to and keep our staff vigilant with all our agency protocols and will continue to maintain a razor focus on this issue. 
Sadly, since our last board meeting, we have lost four employees to COVID-19. Elizabeth Jones, a correctional officer five at the Carroll Young Unit. Herbert Garcia, a correctional officer five in offender transportation. James Weston, a correctional officer at the Johnston Unit. And Donald Parker, food service worker at the Neal Unit. Each of these employees lost their battle with COVID-19. However, they will never be forgotten for their bravery and commitment to public safety and for the ultimate sacrifice that they've paid. We continue to pray for their families and coworkers who still mourn each of these losses and we will honor each of them in our fallen officer service. I would just like to take a moment just to publicly commend the employees of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The men and women in this agency have been heroes throughout this event their daily sacrifice to this state to allow our agency to meet its mission of delivering public safety does not go unnoticed. Chairman, I would also next like to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about recruiting and retention and some efforts we are taking in that area. As you're aware, we face significant staffing challenges over the past two years and despite a pay increase that was provided by the legislature last fall, we have continued to see a drop in our recruiting and retention. Although recruiting is a key part of our ability to staff, retention is equally, if not more important. In order to address this issue, we can't continue to do the same things we've always done and expect different results. With that in mind, I wanted to announce to you some new initiatives that will begin soon as it relates to recruiting and retention. On January 1, we will transition correctional recruiting from the Human Resources Division to the Training and Leader Development Division. The purpose behind the change is to change our recruiting model to one more similar to a military recruiting model that will utilize uniform staff to assist in the recruiting efforts. Additionally, additionally we will use unit uniform staff to work in concert with our recruiting staff to assist in retention. Additionally, excuse me, additionally, we will utilize unit uniform staff to work in concert with our recruiting staff to assist in retention with retention becoming much a much stronger focus in our efforts. Our human resources division will continue to work closely with the training and leader development division to assist in the processing of applicants and staff from the trade as from the training and leader development division and we'll work closely training and leader development if I can read a minute uh, we'll work closely with our unit wardens and correctional institution division leadership on staff retention. These efforts represent a significant shift in our traditional model, however, present, present us with an opportunity to rewire, so to speak, recruiting and retention in this agency. I will update you in future meetings on this transition and, opt, and am optimistic that these changes, we will begin to move, with these changes, we'll begin to move our recruiting and retention in a more positive direction. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Collier. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is the chairman's report. As I have done in past meetings, it is my sad duty today to memorialize those TDCJ staff who have fallen to COVID-19 since the last board meeting. As we enter the fall season, the world continues to search for some sense of normalcy. But this pandemic, which has wreaked havoc across our great land, makes that increasingly difficult. Each day, lives are impacted, loved ones are lost. At this board meeting, we will pause and recognize those who have succumbed to COVID-19. These few minutes allow us to have a brief glimpse into the lives of the everyday heroes who worked for this agency and gave their all for the great state of Texas. Today, we honor their memory. We reflect on a life gone too soon. First, Correctional Officer Elizabeth Jones was an example to everyone around her. 
both on and off the job. A 19-year veteran, she began her career at the Styles Unit and soon transferred to Hospital Galveston. She later moved over to the Young Medical Complex. Elizabeth was considered the heartbeat of the facility. Kim Massey, who was, uh, who was uh, Jones's warden, noted that she would arrive at work early so that she could sit in her car and read the Bible. Her selfless service was an inspiration that helped build a generation of correctional officers, said Miss Massey. When she was not at work, Elizabeth enjoyed shopping or cooking for her husband and two children. Officer Elizabeth Jones died from the coronavirus on August 15th, 2020. Next, if you knew correctional officer Herbert Garcia, then you knew his signature phrase. I've been doing this a long time. I, I can feel for Mr. Garcia on that. With nearly 29 years of service to the agency, Herbert was assigned to the Southern Regional Transport Unit in Rocheron. According to Warden Michael Franks, there was not a day that went by when Officer Garcia did not have a smile on his face and was enjoying life. He was a leader and mentor in the TDCJ family, said uh, Warden Franks. Officer Garcia was a spiritual man who served as a deacon at his church. He was also a loving father and grandfather and a friend to everyone he met. Officer Herbert Garcia died from the coronavirus on August 17th, 2020. Next, correctional officer James Weston Jr. seemed like a character out of a Western movie. He was an expert marksman and he loved horses. James began working for TDCJ 13 years ago and was assigned to the Johnston unit in Winsboro. Warden Virgil McMullen described him as someone who loved his job with the agency while always displaying professionalism. When not at work or enjoying time out at the shooting range, James spent time watching reruns of his favorite show, The Lone Ranger, and that's a good one. And his home in Winsboro was like walking into a Lone Ranger museum. But family was also very important to James. He enjoyed spending time with his sons and especially with his grandson, Hudson, and his granddaughter, Faith. Officer James Weston Jr. died from the coronavirus on August 26, 2020. Finally, if you ever met food service manager Donald Parker at the Neal unit, you probably got a piece of hard candy from him. He handed them out to anyone he came into contact with. It was just one of many things that the employees of the Neal unit in Amarillo remember about him. Mr. Parker uh, worked for the agency for nine years, all of them in the Neal unit. Assistant Warden Charles Bristow described Mr. Parker as someone who had a great rapport with his fellow employees. He just liked to have fun on the job, said Bristow. Everyone at the Neal unit loved him, added Warden Bristow. Food service manager Donald Parker died from the coronavirus on October 1st, 2020. Though these individuals no longer walk among us, their cause is not forgotten. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus instructs those who are weary and carry heavy burdens to bring them to you. I know many of you are weary and the weight of these deaths is burdensome. Take to heart this scripture. I would ask that you continue to pray for their families and coworkers. 
Also, let us keep in our prayers all of the offenders who have succumbed to the virus and their families who grieve for their memories. The virus does not discriminate among the poor or the wealthy, the free or those in prison, but there is one who is always with us. In closing, may, may God watch over and protect every one of us. May he bless you all and may he continue to bless the great state of Texas. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a report from the presiding officer for the Judicial Advisory Council, Judge Rebecca Paloma. Thank you for joining us today. You may proceed. Good morning, everyone. Honorable Chairman O'Daniel, uh, members of the board, Mr. Collier, good morning to everyone present. Uh, my name is Becky Palomo. I'm a district judge in Webb County, Texas. It's an honor to be here presenting before you again today. Our chair, Judge Rose Reyna, unfortunately was not able to be here. And so she sent me on her behalf and on the behalf of, of the Jack again. Uh, before anything, I want you to know that our last Jack meeting was last week on um, October 21st. We were briefed on the legislative appropriations request. We, um, the JAC fully supports this board's LAR and we want to thank you for accepting and including the exceptional item uh, request and um, sustaining our base. Thank you very much for recognizing the importance that probation serves across the state of Texas. The goal of the JAC is to reduce recidivism, to ensure and provide appropriate, appropriate rehabilitative measures uh, across Texas and other needed services, and obviously to also ensure the public safety of the general public here across Texas. And in working to accomplish our goal, we follow uh, the Texas Government Code, Section 493.003B, which tells us what our role is. And uh, pursuant to that statute, uh, the JAC is, um, the JAC's duty is to advise the uh, Criminal Justice Assistance Division Director and the Texas Board of Criminal Justice on matters of importance to the judiciary. And in keeping with our role, at the last JAC meeting, our chair, Judge Reyna, created um, committees. And um, she created a finance committee, or she created the legislative committee first, a finance committee, an education committee, and a probation committee. And those committees will report back to us, uh, which will be included in, in the next report before, before this board. Um, the Jack currently has two vacancies. Um, our DA, um, the DA that's currently assigned and appointed to the Jack is uh, David Escamilla. Some of you may know him, and uh, he is retiring from uh, the Jack. I think he's retiring from his position, and so will no longer be on the Jack. And so that position will become available. And uh, Justice uh, Keller from the Texas uh, Criminal Justice. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Texas uh, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals, excuse me, will appoint his replacement. And the other vacancy that um, is, is coming up is uh, Judge Gillis. Uh, Judge Gillis is also retiring and that uh, reappointment would be, that vacancy will be appointed by um, Judge Nathan Hecht, Chief Justice Nathan Hecht. And so, we're very fortunate to have a Jack that is very active. We meet regularly. Um, we want to ensure we um, are actively participating and ensuring our role and our duty to report to you. Uh, Judge Reina wanted me to ensure that I emphasize the fact that she is always available as, as am I, as the, as the co-chair of the Jack and all members of the Jack are always available to answer any questions and to assist you in any way that you may need, uh, you may need us to help. Okay, on behalf of the Jack, uh, unless there are 
any questions from any members, I wanna thank you again for having us. Thank you, Judge Palomo. And I'm sorry, I had your name wrong initially. To Judge Palomo, thank you very much for that uh, very informative pr uh, presentation. Are there any questions from the board? No, Mr. Hearing Chair. None? Oh, here. No, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to thank Judge Palomo for being here today and, and also working uh, constructively on the legislative uh, appropriations request. Thank you very much uh, to you and your uh, council for your efforts, Judge Palomo. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, thank you again, Judge Palomo, for your presentation. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the proposed Ombudsman Program realignment. Mr. Brian Collier will be presenting. If you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel. Um, Chairman, since you have been our, our chair, you've continued to challenge me and the agency to think outside the box to really reimagine our processes and even as things are running well, to look within and find ways to make our operations even better. The item I bring to you today is born of that ideal. The TDCJ Ombudsman Program was established in May of 1988 and provides a single point of contact for external inquiries. The department within the Administrative Review and Risk Management Division is responsible for investigating and responding to external inquiries made by the general public or elected officials. They are busy. In fiscal year 2019 alone, they received more than 45,000 inquiries. It's a heavy load, but each and every day they rise to the occasion to serve as that point of contact. Responding to inquiries, complaints, and concerns from the public is challenging work in any field or organization. But in, when it involves an agency as large and as complex as the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, which involves safety and welfare of all Texans, but most directly the offenders under our jurisdiction, it's even more demanding. The job requires dedication, determination, and compassion as well as commitment. We're fortunate to have people working in the Ombudsman office who possess those qualities. As to the agenda item, I recommend to the board that the oversight of the Ombudsman program transfer from the Administrative Review and Risk Management Division of TDCJ to directly to the Board of Criminal Justice. The realignment would elevate the office to a place in the TDCJ organizational structure comparable to the PREA Ombudsman, Internal Audit, the Office of Inspector General, and other functions reporting to the board. Given the office's mission and heightened need for independence and communication with board members, I think the status is warranted. I do not feel that such a move would negatively impact the operations of the office or the agency. The Ombudsman program has always worked very closely and well with other TDCJ divisions and departments, and I would not anticipate that that would change. Likewise, the agency has always worked closely and well with offices and entities reporting to the board. The fact that those entities report to the board has never been a hindrance. In fact, their work has been extremely helpful to the agency. I think the timing is right for the change as the position of the lead Ombudsman recently became vacant. As such, we have kept the position unfilled pending your consideration of this proposal so that the board could hire the lead ombudsman if you choose to move the ombudsman program under the board's leadership. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, I will certainly uh, yield to you, Chairman. And I just wanna say thank you all for your consideration of this proposal. And thank you, Mr. Collier, for your hard work on this because this has been in the planning stage for some time. Uh, by you and your staff, so thank you. Yes, sir. Are, are there any questions for Mr. Collier? Uh, if not, I'd like to make a few, a few remarks. Uh, members, uh, the proposal offered by the executive director is something that I have been thinking about for some time. To better understand this change in the organizational structure of the Ombudsman Program, I think you must consider it in the context of the PREA Ombudsman, which has reported to the Board of Criminal Justice 
since the position was created in 2007. The PREA Ombudsman works closely with agency staff in reviewing allegations of sexual abuse. However, reporting directly to the board ensures independence and a direct line of communication between board members and that position. I believe establishing a similar relationship between the board and the TDCJ Ombudsman's program is warranted for the same reasons. Please know that this proposed change is in no way a reflection of any dissatisfaction with the Ombudsman on my part, nor is this move in response to some failing by the Ombudsman program. On the contrary, in my opinion, the Ombudsman's office does an outstanding job responding to inquiries and in reviewing and addressing concerns. I simply feel this realignment will establish a more appropriate organizational structure going forward. And should the board agree, I will appoint a subcommittee to consider applicants for the Ombudsman position. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, if, uh, if not, uh, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the proposed Ombudsman program realignment. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Mr. Nichols. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the internal audit report for fiscal year 2020-2021. Chris Cerrito will be presenting. Mr. Cerrito, if you're ready to begin, please proceed. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members. Mr. Collier, I have a very short update for you this morning. If you will turn to page two of your status report, I have one update, and that is project 2016-07, which is a wheelchair beds walkthrough that is now complete, and that uh, white paper has been sent to your office. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Cerrito. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Mr. Cerrito, for your presentation. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding purchases and contracts over $1 million. Ron Steffa will be presenting today. Mr. Steffa, if you are ready, please proceed. Yes, thank you, Chairman O'Daniel, board members, Mr. Collier. Uh, today, we have one purchase for your review and consideration. It can be found on page seven of your packet behind tab H. It is a blanket purchase order for white twill fabric in the amount of $4 million. Uh, this fabric is used by our garment factories and made into offender clothing. And while the agency does produce this type of fabric, existing inventory was used in the production of the face masks and fabric production has also been impacted as we continue to respond to the pandemic. Uh, the agency is currently producing fabric and this purchase order will be utilized as necessary to supplement the factory's requirements throughout the year. Got pause for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Steffa. Are there any questions or comments from the board? And, and Mr. Steffa, for clarification, um, again, this is a, a drawdown. So if we don't use $4 million, we don't spend $4 million, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Exactly. Thank you for that comment, Mr. De Ayala. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the purchases and contracts over a million dollars as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? A second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Judge Johnson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 
Uh, the next agenda item is the discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a proposed land transaction request for electrical easement expansion at the Monford unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas. Members of the board, I would like to state for the record, I don't ordinarily vote unless it is to break a tie. However, my firm represents the city of Lubbock and Lubbock Power and Light. Therefore, I will not be taking action today on the request for electrical easement expansion at the Monford unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas. Billy Hirsch will be presenting today. Mr. Hirsch, you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman O'Daniel, Mr. Collier, members. As we discussed during the Business and Financial Operations Committee, we have three items on the agenda today. The first, the City of Lubbock acting by and through the Lubbock Power and Light is requesting an easement expansion at the Montfort unit. The city is requesting an easement of 0.842 acres of land being 1,272.79 feet long by a variable width to expand their current 10 foot permanent easement. This request includes temporary workspace totaling 0.262 acres of land. Lubbock Power and Light has agreed to pay $4,615 for this easement with a 10 year term. We'd like to point out that this easement includes language requiring indemnification as the grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause and additional insurance in the amount of $3 million. We recommend that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for the expansion of this electrical easement for the city of Lubbock. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Are there any questions or comments from the board? A brief comment here. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, first of all, congratulations uh, on your new role. Looking forward to working with you in that capacity. Um, and uh, like we're seeing here, these, um, these easements, um, uh, you know, you, the, the role being, being good stewards of uh, the, the state's property, our assets, our land, uh, and making sure that uh, uh, these, these types of arrangements uh, make economic sense and practical sense uh, for the uh, TDCJ. So uh, with, that, with that said, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, you know, today's, um, at least this one, relatively small dollars relative to um, uh, some of the other easements and arrangements that uh, the TDCJ has entered into. However, uh, these arrangements and relationships have long-term uh, effect on uh, the real estate that, that we're stewards of. So, with that said, whether they're small dollars or big dollars, there has to be a big, big picture view, and I appreciate you taking that uh, with respect to, to these items today. And that's yes, it. sir. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. De Ayala, for your comment. Are there any other comments or questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for electrical easement expansion at the Monfer unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas, as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made, has been seconded by Dr. Burrow. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Please let the record show I abstained from voting on the request for electrical easement expansion at the Monford unit in Lubbock County, Lubbock, Texas. The next agenda item is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a proposed land transaction request for a meter site at the Luther unit in Grimes County, Navasota, Texas. Members of the board, I would like to state for the record, I don't ordinarily vote unless it is to break a tie. However, my firm represents ETC Katy Pipeline Limited. Therefore, I will not be taking action today on the request for a meter site at the Luther unit in Grimes County, Navasota, Texas. Mr. Hirsch, please continue. Yes, sir. ETC Katy Pipeline Limited is requesting a meter site overlapping a current permanent pipeline easement at the Luther unit. Katy Pipeline is requesting an easement of approximately 0.057 acres of land being 50 foot long by 50 foot wide. ETC Katy Pipeline Limited has agreed to pay $2,500 for the site with a 10 year term. 
I would like to point out that this easement also involves language requiring indemnification as the grantee's responsibility, the most favored nation clause, and additional insurance in the amount of $3 million. We recommend that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for the easement of ETC Katy Pipeline Limited. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for a meter site at the Luther unit in Grimes County, Navasota, Texas as presented. A motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. A motion has been made, has been seconded by Ambassador uh, Siv. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Please let the record show I abstain from voting on the request for a meter site at the Luther unit in Grimes County, Navasota, Texas. The next agenda item is discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a proposed land transaction, request for amendment to electrical easement at the Ferguson unit in Madison County, Midway, Texas. Members of the board, I would like to state for the record, I don't ordinarily vote unless it is to break a tie. However, my firm represents Houston County Electric Co-op. Therefore, I will not be taking action today on the request for amendment to electrical easement at the Ferguson unit in Madison County, Midway, Texas. Mr. Hirsch, please continue. Yes, sir. The Houston County Electric Co-op is requesting an amendment to an existing electrical easement that covers the East Ham and Ferguson units. The co-op is requesting an easement of approximately 5.15 acres of land being 7,488.36 feet long by 30 feet wide to accommodate an upgrade to the current electrical transmission line service in the Ferguson unit. The term will be renewed with the original easement which expires in December of 2024. No compensation will be offered due to the easement being used to supply electricity to the unit. We recommend that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for the amendment of the electrical easement to the Houston County Electric Co-op. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Texas Board of Criminal Justice approve the request for an amendment to electrical easement of the Ferguson unit in the Madison County, Texas, as presented. Uh, I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made. It has been seconded by Pastor Miles. All those in favor say aye. 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 A opposed? Motion passes. Please let the record show I abstain from voting on the request for amendment to electrical easement at the Ferguson unit in Madison County, Midway, Texas. I would like to thank all of you for coming here today and remind you that the next meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice will be Thursday, December 17th, 2020 via video conference. There being no further business, the 213th meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is now adjourned. It is 11.02, so we will stand down till 11.30 for the Wyndham School District Board meeting. Thank you. Oh, 11.45, excuse me, 11.45, so you've got a break here. <laughs>